Hey, happy Tuesday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Okay, uh, I want to get right back into our examination of Daniel chapter 12, showing the correlation between Daniel 12, Matthew 25, 31 and following, and we will get to Revelation chapter 11, 15 and following because, as I suggested yesterday, <clears throat> I really believe that this conflation of those three passages is absolutely definitive proof, definitive proof, that Matthew 25, 31 and following was fulfilled in the first century, meaning the resurrection was in the first century. Okay? Now, in any kind, in any kind of normal reading of Daniel chapter 12, and of course what we're doing is examining Daniel chapter 12 a little bit in depth to demonstrate that every constituent element of Daniel chapter 12 had to be fulfilled in the days of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> Go back to last Thursday's video in which I demonstrate that Daniel 12 is set in the days of the Roman Empire, just like Daniel 2, the fourth empire, the days of the Roman Empire. In those days, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom shall, that shall never be destroyed. Daniel chapter 7, in the days of the fourth beast, i.e. the Roman Empire, the Son of Man would come on the clouds of heaven in judgment. All three of these passages give us a temporal delimited, delimited time frame and context for the fulfillment of the prophecies, and it's in the days of Rome. So notice now, and be sure to go back and pay very careful attention to what we presented yesterday. <coughs> what I want you to see today is that Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, <coughs> and Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, are in fact linked together. Now, why is that important? Well, it is important because an awful lot of commentators, what I do with it, well, I had it right here. Ah, yes. Uh, look, I, I've, I've only got almost 20 books <laughs> uh, laid out on my desk because the research that I am doing for the work, uh, this book that I'm currently working on, it is entitled The Last Day, The Last Hour, The Last Trumpet Resurrection. It is an examination of the relationship, the connectedness between the Feast of Sukkot and resurrection, the last day, the last hour, the last trumpet resurrection. And so, yeah, my desk is just literally covered with books. And boy, getting all this stuff moved is a nightmare. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in book after book after book, again, like Mr. Kyle Pope in, in the book, Thinking About A.D. 70, what does he tell us? He tells us, verse 1, talking about the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Oh, but wait, verse 2, it's talking about the end of time. Oh, but wait, then... In verse 3, and in verse 9 and 10, and in verse 13, we have other ends. Well, we have the end of Daniel's life, and we have this end, and we have that end. I mean, Mr. Pope just has all of these different ends in the text, and it makes you wonder, how in the world is the reader to discern this? And I must say, with all respect and with all kindness, Mr. Pope's attempt to justify, and by the way, he's not alone, right? You have to understand, former preterist Sam Frost delineates between verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 1, time of anti Epiphanes. Verse 2, end of time. How would you get that from a reading of the text? How would you know that at that time refers to the time of Anti Antiochus Epiphanes, but verse 2 is talking about the end of time? Well, I'll tell you how you get it. <clears throat> you get it by eisegetically approaching the text. And you say something like this. Well, you know what? 
uh, verse 1 has to refer to the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. But since Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 <coughs> is talking about a literal physical resurrection of decomposed bodies out of the dust, then it can't be talking about the time of Antiochus Epiphanes because that would mean that Daniel was wrong. Well, yes, that is what that would prove if Daniel was even predicting a literal physical resurrection of biologically decomposed bodies. But it's interesting to me <clears throat> that even scholars who make that claim that Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 is about the uh, time of Antiochus Epiphanes, John Collins in his commentary on Daniel chapter 12 is now on record as saying that the traditional view, that the only view of resurrection, for instance, of Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, must be a somatic resurrection of human bodies, might need to be re-examined. Well, yeah, it might need to be re-examined. The point of fact is, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> there is absolutely nothing grammatically, textually, and contextually that would ever, that would ever lead one to believe, to know and understand that Daniel 12, 1 is about the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, but Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 is about some event that's still in your future and mine. Talk about a theory that is full of holes. If you posit that Daniel was written, let's just round it off at 500 B.C. That's not an absolutely accurate statement. But if you say that Daniel was written 500 B.C., then here's what you have. <clears throat> you have Daniel predicting the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, 174 to 164, 165 B.C. And then in the period at the end of verse 1, you have inspiration inserting a 2,500-year gap into the period at the end of verse 1. Because after all, verse 1, 174 to 164 B.C., Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, end of time. Well, we are 500 years removed from the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. And you see, John Collins, for instance, believes that Daniel was written ex eventu is the term they use. In other words, it was actually written after the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, but it describes those events as if it was writing prophecy. Because you see, John Collins does not believe in actual, actual inspired prophecy. That's how they make that argument. Others say, okay, well, okay, yes, Daniel chapter, or Daniel was written in the 6th century B.C., but it did predict the events of Antiochus Epiphanes as genuine prophet prophecy, but it is predicting the end of time. They tried to avoid that conundrum of being accused of not believing in inspiration. But Let's take a look at the text. At that time, we've already explained to you, that's the time of the Roman Empire. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands, watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of great trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now what? watch. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. All right. They're going to be delivered. Who's going to be delivered? Daniel's people, the righteous, the righteous elect. When would they be delivered? Oh, I wonder if that might be at the time of the resurrection. Out of the dust. And make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, the terminology of being in the dust does not have to refer to being in the dirt. It is a highly metaphoric, Hebraic concept of being downtrodden, oppressed, alienated from God. 
you know, God said to Adam, you're going to return to the dust. Well, while I certainly believe in a literal creation of Adam, I also believe that returning to the dust meant returning to a state outside of God's fellowship before he came into fellowship with God, a lowly state. I know that's controversial, but I believe it certainly matches because he was outside the garden. And it's in the garden where fellowship was. N.T. Wright seems to take, seems to take that same position. So my, here's my point, that when Daniel was told, number one, about the Great Tribulation, but number two, about the deliverance of the people, even those written in the, in the book, where do we find, ladies and gentlemen, the deliverance of those written in the book? Oh, we find that Revelation chapter 20 which, by the way, just like Daniel chapter 12, is about the time of the fulfillment of Israel's feast days. Because, you see, the books were opened on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Those were the book of life and the book of death and the, and the intermediate book. Edersheim and other Jewish scholars expound on this. So when Daniel is told that his people would be delivered, even though it's found written in the book. He's talking about the righteous whose names were written in the book of life being delivered at the time of the resurrection. That means Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, is not divorced from Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Because, you see, those written in the book would be delivered, saved, at the time of the resurrection. So thematically, <clears throat> in, res or in regard to theme, Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 is the time of the resurrection of, Dan of Revelation chapter 20, which is the resurrection of Daniel chapter 12 verse 2, and Revelation chapter 20 is the time of the consummation and the fulfillment of Israel's festal calendar just like Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, is the fulfillment of Israel's festal calendar. So guess what? If that resurrection, if that deliverance of those written in the book has not taken place, then Israel's festal calendar is not fulfilled. But guess what? That would mean that Torah, every jot, every tittle of the law of Moses is still in effect. You cannot divorce Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, ladies and gentlemen, from the consummation of Israel's covenant history. <clears throat> the fulfillment of every jot and every tittle of her feast days, her prophetic feast days, which pointed to the resurrection at the end of the days. Therefore, it is absolutely wrong and false to divide Verse 1 of Daniel 12 from Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. They are united. And you know what? Tomorrow, I'm going to have more to say about that. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you on the flip side.